record. <laughs> well, hello everyone. Uh, I'm Sneja Gunev and uh, I'm co convening this group. Um, potentially there will be more people signing up and some people have actually said that they can't make this meeting, um, but we are recording it and it'll be available for people to catch up. So there have been quite a few questions already, and most of you have been privy to those questions, and they're often along the lines of give us some, you know, give us some facts. What, how, how does this work? And the ideal person to address this is our speaker today. So Penny, <laughs> I was so lucky, Penny Gersin, who's only recently joined the college, which is wonderful, um, is Professor Emeritus in the School of Community and Regional Planning, and director of the Housing Research Collaborative Project at UBC, and an immensely knowledgeable person about all these things. Um, she'll be speaking, what will you be speaking about, 20 minutes, something yeah. like that? Yeah. yeah. And then uh, the chat function is open. People can put questions in, and we can use the raised hand. And then we can, uh, yeah, see how it goes. And um, let's let's get cracking. I want to hear all about it. Okay. Welcome, Penny. <laughs> okay, so um, slide show. Okay. So, oh, that is weird. Uh oh. Okay, there. Uh, I'm just gonna, um, I'm going to make a uh, it, yeah, via thumbnail. So uh -uh, I have to go back up. Oh. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Let's start this again. Okay. Play from start. Okay. So I, um, I'm, you know, it's really nice to see um, sort of some people that I know already and others that I'm hoping you know, to get to know now that I'm in this emeritus status. Um, this is something that is actually quite, that I'm, I'm quite interested in because I, I do think that um, we really need to be thinking about uh, new models of, of people, uh, new, mo new housing models as people age. Um, and it became really, really uh, evident to me um, um, when my mother, who has been, uh, who was very active before that, but um, she had a fall, so she went into assisted living, and she was in assisted living for five years before she passed away in November. Um, and I could just see the frustrations of this is, you know, uh, that she was feeling of being in a, a, a you know, a, a place, even though she had her own unit and you know she only had she had a one bedroom apartment um but it was it was very frustrating for having somebody who who was used to being very independent very uh you know had you know had a lot of autonomy um you know wanting to make her own decisions being in a place in a place like this and especially during covid it just became really really quite difficult so this is something that is actually near and dear to my heart i mean to start looking at different kinds of models so just looking just giving you a very quick um, context is that um statistics canada projects that uh, close to a quarter of canadians will be over 65 years old by 2031 um currently um 56 percent of, of aging Canadians are, are women, and that's women, uh, people over 65. Um, and um, uh, I, I think the governments, uh, all levels of government are, are recognizing that, that they need to work to support these trends um, and to ensure because, you know, it's such a large segment of the population uh, to give them access to healthy, affordable and the right supply, you know, the supply, uh, uh, the right supply of housing options, the ones that fit their needs. Um, and we need to support all stages of aging. So I've just given this is actually from a, um, a student uh, work, and I'll give you some references to it afterwards. They sort of labeled um, sort of young 
uh, young aging Canadians, that's the term aging Canadians, we don't use seniors anymore, we use aging Canadians, um, which is go-go, which is active, um, and that they need little or no, or, or, or no assistance. And I'm not going to give you particular ages for the for these groups because it really, really varies by each person. You know, some people are really slowing down at a, at a, you know at a, at a younger age, where other people are still you know very, very active up up until their their 90s. And even I have an aunt who's 103 who I regularly still have really interesting conversations with. So, and uh, then there's slow go, which is decreasing energy levels um, and some assistance may be, be needed. And that, you know, that's when, um, uh, you know, they're, they're becoming more cautious. Um, you know, they're, you know, they're, they're recognizing some of the limitations that they, that they, um, that they have, uh, um, and um, they're sort of uh, wondering whether their current housing situation really fits their needs. And then there's the no-go, which the li limited energy levels and assistance often needed. And I want to just use my mother's example as my mother um, passed away when she, when she was 98 and she moved into assisted living when she was 93. And even up until she had another fall, which is sort of real predicator of a predictor of, of sort of a, a decline after that. Um, that's when she recognized that she needed um, more assistance. She needed companions. Um, she was using a walker and those kinds of things. Um, so that's sort of the what I'm what the students and these are the 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 terms that they are using, but what they meant by no go, it's just you're you're very you're you're very it's a very limited geographical reach that you're that you're you're doing and you're um, and affecting you know and your energy levels uh, reflect that. Um, but regardless of all of this, you need to support inclusion um, at all stages. And so, um, what are you know what are we aiming for here in this group? Um, and so, I just want to give you some of the some definitions, you know, just to start thinking about it. So, an inclusive community is uh, one that values all its members and helps them to meet their basic needs. Um, so they can live in dignity, engage actively, and contribute to their community. And so, um, I mean, this is sort of written a lot about it. You know, when when people when when uh, uh, cities and municipalities do uh, um, community plans, they talk about how they want inclusive communities so that all ages could be could be able to be uh, living and working and and recreating and in in, uh, in the community. But an intentional community is really, um, it, it's really a, a community based on shared values, and it can be people um, collected in a house, in a group of houses, an apartment block, or at a neighborhood scale. Um, and it, it supports relationships and community building and, and improving social interactions and bonds. I mean, and, um, uh, and, and the examples I'm going to be giving after this um, you know, they they demonstrate, you know, sort of uh, kind of a certain kind of intentionality that, that, that people are really seeking um, a community, they're seeking uh, more so social in interactions. And then there's inclusive or supportive housing. Um, it's uh, uh, in, in relation to the needs. So inclusive housing provides um, suitability in relation to the needs of the residents, which may include physical accessibility and access to needed support. Um, and it's also designed just to, to facilitate social inclusion, uh, both in, within the housing and the local community. And so we talk, and you've probably heard, um, uh, about supportive housing for people who are uh, homeless or near homeless. Um, those are the um, temporary um, a modular housing that is being that's been built around the city and uh, actually all through throughout BC um, for and and these were uh, in, you know they they have both um, 
uh, their individual units, but then they have a lot of support in them. They have sort of people that are uh, that are providing that kind of support, and and they have facilities that sort of acknowledge that. And and the ones that I've seen, they have shared. They have a kitchen where people could be dining and those kinds of things. And then there's and I know a lot of people have been talking about how they would really like to be aging in place. Um, and having access to services um, and social health and social supports, supports that you need to live safely and independently in your home or your, your community as for as long as you wish or able. So um, most people, are, when they think about aging in place, they're thinking about just, well, what do they need for, for um, uh, to, to, to age in their own home? But I think you can look at aging in places in a wider way is that you could be aging in place in your community. Like there's some aspects about your community, community that you really would like to still, uh, you would is very important to you. So you'd still like to be really living in those community, in, in that community, but your, your, your living unit, your home, uh, may not be lo no longer suitable, and one of the problems right now is that we that that there are so few uh, alternatives for people to age in place. Um, hmm, I wonder what happened there. Okay, so I'm just going to give you some examples um, so of sort of um, what I, I'm talking about in terms of. In, in, oh, I know. Yes, you're right. Okay. I'm gonna to have to go around again. Uh, <laughs> um, so just to give you an idea of uh, the fact that there has been um, models uh, as far back as the as the 15th century. So, um, on the right-hand side is a uh, Harlem Alms House for older single women that is actually still in use. And I visited it a few years ago and it's just absolutely lovely. Uh, it was built by a benefactor by a, um, a who, who um, wanted to ensure that his uh, uh, workers who were uh, predominantly women, I think there, I think it was a, a mill, uh, a mill um, factory. Um, uh, that they would they that they were properly housed. So he built this, and then it it's uh, it's now continuing to to the day to today. I mean, it, it's been renovated, but and you know modernized. But it was built in the in the 16th century, which is quite amazing. And then the, there's another example in in Amsterdam, um, which is uh, another what they call the alms houses, um, and it was originally um, a sisterhood, but then today it's houses are occupied by older single women. So there's real models in other places, but I, I mean, the ones that I found the most interesting were in, in the Netherlands. So I'm just going to give you some examples of some inclusive communities. Um, and uh, uh, the first one, and I know... Um, uh, I know that many people have, have talked about uh, co-housing. Um, and uh, co-housing, first of all, co-housing is, is different from co-op co co housing. So co-op housing in, in Canada is housing that has been predominantly subsidized by um, the federal government, by CMHC, um, and built um, in, uh, to uh, it, uh, it, uh, that that is pro that provides uh, housing for a mix of incomes, and in fact, a mix of incomes are needed in order to subsidize uh, so higher income people's in um, uh, uh, housing payments are needed to subsidize the lower income people. Um, but they and they um, and you don't own your your unit. What you do is you own you have a share of the co-op. Um, whereas co-housing, it's a type of collaborative housing um, that is really intended for, um, you know, the, the intention was for people who really wanted more community. Um, 
and and felt um, uh, and wanted that uh, and wanted to have sort of um, that the social interactions that a community would provide. It is um, uh, the the residents are integral to the design and development of the community, um, and so they can they are can be even the developers. Um, there's now sort of development consultants who are doing co-housing. Um, co-housing, just to say, it's first started in Denmark and they um, there's uh, now there's co-housing projects all over the world and you can Google co-housing and find out more about it. Um, but it combines the autonomy of self-contained private units with the benefit of shared community amenities. Um, they include a dining room, a large dining room, kitchen, recreation spaces, meeting rooms, children's play spaces, guest rooms, workshops, and gardens. Um, and, uh, and so in, the, in your own um, unit, you have a kitchen. So, you know, you could be cooking and you can be doing the things, but the, the thing that makes this uh, co-housing very special is that um, it's decided in the, uh, within the community uh, whether you would like to share meals. And that's sort of something that I think is a really important part of that. I mean, sharing meals really does bring people together because you have to uh, share in the cooking. You know, you have to take turns cooking. You have to, you know, to preparing, buying, th those kinds of things. And then what, um, uh, uh, and, and the actual uh, eating of the meal does provide that really important community setting. Um, so a lot of the co-housing uh, do this. They and and that's why there are a provision within uh, the development for these large uh, dining rooms. Um, and uh, because there's this extensive common spaces, um, the the units themselves do not have to be as large. Um, the, the ownership is usually uh, a strata corporation. So, um, so if um, uh, so, you you own your own unit and you can sell your own unit. Um, but some communities have have have, have chosen to use the co-op share structure, which I was describing to you. Um, and but and, but co-housing in itself is does not generate uh, below market priced homes, uh, which. Uh, the co-op housing does, um, but it, you can, uh, you know, there is a realization of some uh, saving over time because of the way that, it, because they, that you save on development charges, um, uh, you know, that uh, like a developer, you always has, has a profit margin in, in, in their developments and in the, um, and usually these co-housing projects are built to a very high uh, sustainability and ecological uh, sort of standards, so that um, uh, you're you're saving on heating and cooling and, and these kinds of things. And so these are just some pictures of uh, some co-housing projects. One of the this is a co-housing project, and and in um, in Vancouver, it's um, uh, it's in the east side of Vancouver. It's in Cedar Cedar Cottage. Uh, it, it's the only one I know of in Vancouver, but there's ones in Burnaby, North Vancouver, um, uh, uh, Langley, um, uh, Langley Township, um, uh, no, sorry, Fort Langley, and there's one in um, in Souk. And you can see in the one in Souk, this is that this is the 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 uh, the common kitchen and and sort of. Um, uh, recreation space um a lot of the, a lot of uh the co-housing what they look for is really a mix of ages and um household types um because there's very you know they they're building various units um and um and if you are in at the very beginning then you could sort of you know select and 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 personalize your your own unit um, the one in Co the one in Vancouver, I know, for example, is there are seniors there, but there I think it's predominantly a lot of young families. So this is a model that I wanted to use, and I just found out about this when I was traveling in the early. Um, uh, uh, I was in Europe in early in early um, September, and I met somebody from from Arizona who was living, or a couple who were living in um in this and um i just 
I found this as an interesting example because we're now, I think that, that you know, there might be some possibility of talking to the university about building some housing for people, for eight, for for emeritus and things like that. So um, what what they've done in a, 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 at Arizona State University is they have a partnership with um, uh, with a, 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 it's a, it is a private company called Pacific Retirement Services and Arizona State. And they built um, this uh, this development. Uh, but what it included in the in the in the project are um, facilities for uh, the Arizona State uh, classrooms uh, for for the classrooms. Um, there's a lot of mingling between students and and uh, the 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 residents, the, the sort of the um, the seniors in in these um, in the in the project and. Um, it's uh, the people that I talked to just said they loved it. They actually, um, it was quite a sweet story. They they were two singles and they moved in and they each bought a unit and then they came together and they sold their unit and bought a bigger unit. So, uh, okay, then this is another example. And this is again, this is actually um, uh, in, uh, in, you can see the, the photo is at Abbey Field House in Shaughnessy. And there's a number, there's two Abbey Fields in Vancouver and there's others uh, across the province and also in Canada and, and in other places. Um, and it's core mandated to provide affordable accommodation and companionship for, for lonely elders within their own, within a local community. Um, uh, and they, a typical small group of residents live together with the house manager. So they each have their own bedroom, but they share, um, they share cooking and things like that. Um, uh, and they're, and it's provided by a small staff. Um, and the way that each operate is each house, each separate house is a nonprofit registered charity. And then finally, um, I uh, I think some of you at least have heard about La Maison de Bagayags, Baba Yagas, um, uh, which is in France, um, and it's a senior cooperative housing community for women, um, founded on feminist and ecological values, um, and the principles of support into old age through through frequent social interactions and mutual age mutual aid self management and remaining active um and and it was founded uh, there was a uh, one particular woman who really uh really uh, was the spearhead for the you know was the was the real catalyst for this the champion for this um she just uh recognized that she had uh, that you know, she wanted, as she aged, to live the, her values as she uh, as she aged, and so she really um, uh, worked, you know, you know, and really, um, uh, how, you know, uh, made sure that the that the government of of Montreal were was very aware about this need, and. Um, and there was, uh, and so the development was not was 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 only made possible uh, with the financial support of the housing authority and other and other government agencies. Um, the name comes from Baba Yaga, a ferocious witch in Slavic uh, folklore. For the Baba Yagas, the name is uh, was tongue in cheek reference to society's uh, perception of single women. And residents pay an average of 420 euros monthly, which is really very low. I mean, it's a very affordable to live in the community. And that's only made uh, 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 possible by the uh, subsidies and support that uh, various levels of government in France has, has done to, to this. And as I and I'm, I don't know, but I, I, uh, I have not heard of any other uh, Baba Yaga House in um, uh, um, in France. I know that there's a group in Toronto who's trying to start a Baba Yaga House, um, but so far they haven't they haven't been, realized this. It's been going for 
uh, at least five or six years that they've been trying to do this. Um, the target population is women over 60, um, and they don't employ a professional staff. Um, so each resident is re responsible for, for chores, um, and they pool their resources um, to have uh, professionals come in. And so it is very much a cooperative model and it's for people, for women within, in, uh, I would say, you know, in, in fairly low income situations. And, but it's been amazingly um, successful. I mean, there, it's, it's being sort of touted as a very, as a model all over the place. So these are just, this is a photo of just what it looks like. And this is um, a group um, uh, having a, um, a, a dinner together. So just to end, um, what to consider. So in order to really, uh, you know, I just want to get you thinking about this is I think you really need to think about what are the values that will guide you as you age and how can that be realized in your housing? So, um, you know, we're in, in Canada, we're used to living uh, predominantly in our own units. I mean, you know, housing units. I mean, how prepared are we to be doing to, you know, at what level and how much are we prepared to share? Um, and whether it's important to you, sort of these community and social actors, uh, important to you or, and and what are you prepared to do to ensure that, that, you, that, that these are um, realizable? And then what physical design and governance structure would best fit your values and principles? And how are you going to realize this? Who is willing to champion what you want? Um, how, would, how are you going to move forward? And these are just some references from uh, the Housing Research Collaborative that I drew upon in order and for this presentation. So I will now stop sharing. Okay. Um, Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. There. Good. Excellent. Well, okay. thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and I, um, we've got the chat function on if people want to use that. But obviously, we can also use uh, the hand, the hand up if you've got particular questions. Um, one of the things, of course, when we were beginning to convene this is that the Baba Yaga model was exactly the one that inspired me. And what also inspired me um, was many, many <laughs> decades of being interested in the kinds of models that uh, women came up with as artists, as writers. Um, and I should tell you that uh, Dubravka Ugresic, who is a Croatian writer, has written a wonderful novel that I recommend highly called Baba Yaga laid an egg, uh, which is a very, very amusing um, kind of tackling of that particular issue of aging, but also of that myth of the Baba Yaga as a, as a kind of a, a, a witch in, in uh, Slavic folklore. Uh, but there are many others. And the, the other inspiration for me was uh, Leonora Carrington, uh, an artist who died just before she turned 100, but uh, was uh, a surrealist artist who formed a community in Mexico, uh, which was made up of a lot of uh, friends, many women, artists as well. And she wrote, again, a, a highly satirical novel about what aging and aging women's communities um, are like, called The Hearing Trumpet. And uh, she wrote it actually in her 40s, but it is, a, again, it's a wonderful read. So there are many, many examples from culture, from film, from writing, from art um, that I've so, certainly found inspiring in terms of, you know, thinking somewhat more abstractly about these things. But of course, it does also um, include very much the dimension of the practicalities of how we actually come together to uh, maybe think of ways to, to get this established. So any questions? Well, there's one, there's one question now uh, from Kay, uh, and that's in the chat. Um, yeah. yeah, I would say that the, that uh, it, uh, they, do, they don't have the kind of government support 
um, that they got in in uh, France, and this was really because this one woman was was fierce. <laughs> I mean, she really was a Baba Yaga, right? So she um, and so uh, it, it is. You know, the the cost of of housing is so expensive, and and um, as we know, women's incomes are much less than uh, and men, than men, and they. And as they age, um, you know, they have less uh, money to, to put towards this. So this would have to be, they'd have to be putting in a considerable amount of their own money. And um, they don't really have uh, uh, support from government for it. So um, that's just my understanding. So, um, but I mean, they, the, the idea is, uh, I mean, there are uh, opportunities to form a nonprofit society um, and then you know try to to get support from a government that way so that so I'm you know and I'm not sure if that's the route they're going or ally themselves with the nonprofits because there are nonprofits but then you know each nonprofit housing society has its own values and principles and and governance structure and and you know way they want to do it and not and non you know so uh it, it is it's complicated yeah so Nicola you've got your hand up yeah, yeah um Thanks, Peg Penny, for a great presentation. Um, I, I, I'm not clear totally on the difference between a co-op and co-housing. Yes. And, and, and does co-op imply that there's some government support? I mean, I know sometimes yes. the government provides the land, right? Yes. So co-op housing, I mean, so, so, so co-housing is really... Uh, it, it, there isn't um, government support for co-housing. So, so what it is is it, it's 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 very much like a, a condominium, except that you have you could be the developers, your own developers. You form, you, you know, you can for, be the developer team. I mean, often now they have development consultants, uh, but you know what you get in the end is you get your own unit, and you can and you can sell that unit at market rate. So in co-op housing, that was started in the, in the um, uh, 70s, and it was, you know, the height of it was in the sort of 70s, 80s, um, uh, you know, the federal government stopped sort of building co-op co housing, cooperative housing in the mid, or, or supporting cooperative housing in the mid uh, 90s, uh, except, and the only provinces who are still building cooperative housing are like BC and Quebec, uh, predominantly, and, and BC is still building it because they've they figured out a variety of very innovative do, ways of doing it. Um, uh, but it is, uh, the, the what happened is that it's the government uh, 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 subsidized their mortgages, um, uh, 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 you know, municipal governments uh, provide land. So it was a way, and, and they're still building. I mean, there's still, there's a new one that was just built in, in the Fraser lands in, in uh, South Vancouver. Um, so they're building, uh, but it but it, that's the way it has to be done is the municipal government, the province, the province came in with money, uh, Van City gave them some loans. And, you know, so it's a whole variety of ways of doing it, but the only way that it could be, um, uh, done is with government uh, support, and uh, and even then, um, I was just looking. Um, uh, they they are advertising there in that in that new um, uh, co-op housing uh, project in Fraserlands. They're looking for people with incomes between uh, like fifty five thousand and eighty thousand because. Um, rent is geared to income, and so they need higher income people to li be living there in order to subsidize the, the lower income. So that's the model that that they're doing. So, um, but the, you know, as you walk around in neighborhoods, like at the foot of of Granville Island, is a is a cooperative housing project that was built in the in the eighties. You know, um, it's a high rise. Um, you know, th so there are co-ops uh, actually, and in in False Creek, there's a number of co-ops. I mean, co-op housing, and that's um, uh, one of the issues that uh, is being affected by South, South uh, False Creek is because they thought they were going to be losing 
their, the government subsidies, and also they could lease land there. So they, they thought they were going to lose their leases, and the city is somehow being proposed um, much higher density and to get rid of uh, the co-ops to say, well, I'm not sure if they're going to be able to do that, but that that's kind of, um, it's, it's, it's a lot, been a long drown out process. So but how do you qualify for the government support? How do you qualify yourself to get into a co-op? Well, yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. No, I mean, you have to, okay. So each co-op has, uh, has its own waiting list. So you find out about a co-op that you like and want, and, and you can go on to the, uh, the Cooperative Housing Federation of BC and go on to the, to the waiting list and I, I go on and look at all of the co-ops and they actually even list co-ops that are, that are looking for, for people or, or that you could be put on the waiting list, waiting list, but they're so popular, um, you know, but they are building them still, all, all, you know, they're building one actually in, in Burnaby right, you know, now that's being, you know, that they're looking at, but there are, um, and they're, you know, they're quite good. I mean, that when they were built, they were fairly modest, but I mean, one of the best examples, uh, you know, the, some of the nicest ones are in in um, South Falls Creek, where you know when you're walking along, um, the 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 stucco ones that are that are townhouses, and those are co-ops. Yeah. So the variety of co-ops. Yeah. So, but, it, but without um, government support, it can't be done. So Lorraine has got a question, and then we have Isabel. Okay. Lorraine, yes, your question. Um, okay, I, I posted it on chat. Um, UBC involvement. Penny, you referred briefly to UBC involvement. Can you say more about that? Well, I mean, I, I mean, maybe Stacia could talk more about that because uh, uh, she was just at a uh, meeting of uh, where the uh, the people from the uh, the UBC college, the, club, uh, the um, emeritus college, met with. Uh, the planning team that is doing the the planning for for the campus, and um, I, you know, I, I do think you know this is an idea that we should be introducing it to the. Um, uh, so, in so Anne Anne is uh, nodding. Anne, um, how, do you know a bit more about this? You have to unmute yourself, though. Yeah. No, I'm sorry, I wasn't able to attend the latest update, but. I think there's the University Vision 2050, which calls for a huge development uh, towards a community on the campus, as opposed to just going to classes and heading somewhere else to go home. Uh, but we've also got the Broadway corridor uh, with massive amounts of uh, expansion proposed there. And then the Jericho development. So, right. And these are all uh, major housing initiatives. Right. So, yeah. So I mean, just, unless you know, if, I mean, this is the this thing, and so that's why I I introduced the idea of the Marabella, which is at at uh, Arizona State University. I mean, that is like a private company, um, uh, you know, partnering with a university. But I mean, there is also possibilities of the of the university, you know, working with a group uh, in a co housing sort of situation. So I and and I know there's been a number of attempts to do build co-housing by uh, existing faculty, which has not been successful. But you know maybe there's like some possibility, given they oh, recognize how difficult it is for yeah, faculty. So right the, now. the further supplement, Lorraine, is I think that uh, it's the need is to uh, do some in, um, fact finding, get a group together and make presentations to the planning group because they're more than happy to meet again with members of the college. So if we get some kind of plan together and uh, kind of model it on the Arizona State um, plan um, to give indications of where this could go, that could be a starting point. Put it this way, it's up there as a possibility, but it will take some uh, some work to kind of realize it. I wonder if you see not. Sorry, I'm not using the uh, the Mirabella as as like a best practice. No, no, no. I, I just, because you know, I think there's some people who are saying, 
you know, why, why is Arizona State, why is the university using up this land um, for, for obviously it was because it's very expensive. It's not cheap to, for them, for people to go into these units and every, to buy these units. So, um, you know, so I'm not saying that that's the best model, but I just, I just found that partnership interesting. So sorry, somebody was starting mm -hmm. to. Uh, I wonder if an, if a hybrid model wouldn't wouldn't work well at UBC. Multi generational, obviously. Mm -hmm. So out of the ghetto of student housing, one might imagine something more interesting for certain possibly interested students, possibly interested emeriti who would want to maintain connection with students. Um, perhaps develop. You know, you mentioned classrooms in the Arizona place. Well, maybe classrooms, maybe meeting rooms, maybe mm -hmm. I don't know what kinds of opportunities for um, interesting and complicated kinds of interactions that most of us who spent our lives at places like UBC are already used to. And as a new emeritus myself, I would say what I miss most is daily interaction with students. Mm -hmm. uh, if I were going to be involved in planning something of this sort, um, that would be a very, very high priority for me, not to create an elder ghetto, which might well suit some people, but what would suit me personally if I were going to get involved um, would be something that really draws on the complexity of social interface in the university and works with that as a priority. Yes, I, I, I think I totally agree with you because um, one of the, the phrases that came to me when you're kind of bombarded with this lifelong learning, lifelong learning, what about lifelong teaching? Yes, <laughs> no, yes. What about that? <laughs> so, Isabel, you had your... Um, yeah, uh, Penny, you showed us a photo of, of a Vancouver co-housing project with multi-age yeah. group, you know, multi-generational setup. Uh, where is it and how did that start? It's it's in Cedar Cottage. Um, I you know just just go actually Google um, yeah. co housing Vancouver and it has the address. I you know I think it's e it's East Thirty Third. It's in Cedar Cottage. It's really nice. Yeah. How how did they get that off the ground? Do well, you know? I mean, this was it took a long time and it was a group. You know what they did was they just called for um, interested people. To come together and they uh, um, and now I think it was done I mean it might have even been a like the co-housing consultant who, who's been doing this um, for a while might have you know called them together there might have been a few people interested and then they put out a call and then a group of people finally formed and then they had to ensure that there was real buy-in so people had to you know significantly contribute money uh, before they could do it but they ended up doing it it was it's quite yes. lovely. One of the one of the future speakers that I'm trying to uh, get to to speak to this group is Catherine uh, Fisher, who was involved very much in the Keyside Village uh, co-housing development um, project, and and she's just uh, her book on that has just been released. So um, she's someone that I'm hoping to attract um, for the December meeting, um, and I'm working on that. So she she can give us the nuts and bolts of what was involved in in getting that set up. Yeah. Um, but uh, Nikola, you you sent us a, a sad little note about um, what happened with uh, an earlier attempt in the chat <laughs> that ended up as being tapestry, which is all very oh. fine and good, but it's uh, a very expensive place. Yes. Yeah. But the, um, yeah. I can. I. <laughs> it's a good cautionary tale. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's what's happened with the co-housing plans here. I mean, they, you know, at, at UBC, they, they just didn't, they haven't really gone anywhere. But, you know, like there are, um, I, I, I suspect that there, I mean, this is another way to sort of start working is, is that there are faculty, I'm sure a lot of, there would be some real interest in faculty in co-housing because yeah. it, um, mm -hmm. uh, I think they would be really interested. I think there are people that would be interested in being part of it. So it could be, you know, a co-housing between the faculty and, and emeritus faculty. I mean, one of the things I really, um, I've been looking at the website and everything like that, and I really have uh, the emeritus college, and I really appreciate the number of, of uh, uh, sort of partnerships and, you know, that, that the emeritus college has already uh, develop between different institutions on campus. I think that's really exciting. So, you know, this might be something that um, uh, approaching the, the uh, um, 
the faculty association and seeing if some, you know, if this would be something they'd be interested in. So, mm -hmm. yeah. so Carolyn. Yes. Well, my point is very much related to Nicholas point and but just from a slightly different um, point of view and that is many years ago and I believe it was Chuck Sloniker and Thelma Weeks who spearheaded this uh, Nicola you can correct me Nicola yeah. Yeah, and Ray were certainly involved in the discussions um, talked with the university about the necessity for providing housing for retired faculty and as Nicola pointed out um, it turned out to be tapestry, which is, was not really what anybody in that group had in mind. Although I will say Thelma Weeks lives in it now uh, quite happily. Um, but um, what it shows is the possibility of negotiating with the university to address such needs. And if you, again, tie that in with what Anne mentioned about you know, the, the 50 or 2050 plan, um, that also provides an umbrella where you can, within which you can make an argument. So mm -hmm. although the, the goal would be quite different, at least there is some precedent for the university um, trying to address these needs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yes. Well, we, we actually have uh, an acting uh, president who uh, is, was signed up to come here before, but but had to bow out because she's got other pressing issues like being the acting president. So uh, Deborah Buzzard. So she might be, you know, that this might be a good time to to renew this because yes. <laughs> she said she was really interested in this in this yeah. area. So yeah, yeah. So I'll be interested if people could email me with suggestions for speakers and and topics. Um, in in the future meetings, but uh, if we stay with the second, you know, Thursday of the month, the next meeting would be um, on the tenth of November, um, and I'll send around a message about that and also accept suggestions from people. But as I said, I'm hoping that for the December meeting, we might be able to get Catherine to talk to us about the Keyside um, co-housing uh, project. And any other suggestions that people have um, about what they'd like to hear about and also suggestions of models that they know about themselves. The Baba Yaga, one of the things that I found out from Penny was that one of her students has written um, a long essay about the Baba Yaga project and uh, uh, analysis of that, which is I found extremely interesting. So um, I think we should be starting to compile a kind of a, a reading list or or uh, information and links uh, that would be useful to pursue. And you want to? So people may not uh, know that I'm uh, currently the principal uh, for this year um, uh, of the college, uh, but if at some point you want to conduct a survey uh, to get uh, ideas from the entire um, group of Ameritai, uh, we yeah. totally be able to do that and more than supportive. Um, I know there's a, a reasonably large number of Ameriti uh, who already live on campus, who took advantage of, uh, in a sense, subsidized housing and were able to buy uh, homes on, on campus, uh, townhouses and so on. Um, and it would be very interesting to know how many people currently reside very close to the university campus and who might be interested in a co-housing um, uh, collaborative development. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Comments? I'd Go just ahead. say quickly, as somebody who's never been able to afford to live on the university campus, that um, I, I hope that if this endeavor goes forward, even just as research, that, that we bear in mind that not only, as we all know, is tapestry horrendously expensive, but that many of the kinds of options afforded to faculty other than student style apartments on campus are also ferociously expensive. So mm -hmm. I, I would hope that we would avoid walking ourselves into the university's money trap um, on being used as, uh, as bait for their, their billionaires um, um, quest and, and vision and words of that sort. I would like to see us think about how we could begin to have discussions with student groups 
about this. If we are, if, if others uh, perhaps share my interest in a multi-generational um, approach, how would we make that come to life? If we begin to think about conversations with different student groups now, we not only make it more difficult for the university to try to buy us out again, tapestry style, but we build in at the ground level, something that's more complex and generative, and for me at least, interesting and lively than perhaps we could do on our own. I think that such a, such a conversation might also be of great political interest to the university. And I don't, I don't think it would circumvent uh, the, the vast grab for money, but it would provide salutary advertising for them. Uh, and that might serve as well. Just a thought. Thank you. Thank you. I, I, I mean, I think that's a great idea because I, I know, uh, I mean, I, I, I like there I is now, um, uh, I mean, I think that that AMS would be very interested in the and and the Graduate um, Student Society would be very interested in talking about this. Um, AMS actually does have well, they don't have that much money, but they do have some money. Given you know part of the the fees go there, and um, and and I think they they recognize the 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 real problem about housing for students. I mean, as as you probably know, this you know the you know, we're, you know housing is is you know a horrible problem for everybody, but for students right now, there was just some news. There was there was just some news items. I think even last week or the week before about how students are now having to use um, more food banks. Um, yeah, exactly. you know, and that's being depleted. The so Penny, um, drawing drawing um, um, on, on your own links, uh, is it possible to set this up through your uh, housing research collaborative um, UBC project? Because I think that would be a brilliant base from which to launch these dialogues with the AMS and with the uh, the Graduate Student Association is that possible? Would that be a possibility? Well, I'd have to go back to my my. Uh, I have a staff, and and yeah, yeah. we're sort of looking for you know they need to be <laughs> funded you know funded and everything. I mean, if we, I I'll, I'll bring I'll raise this, and we have a yeah. meeting next week, and I'll raise yeah. this. So. Because okay. this is a, a very specific interest group, uh, brimming with ideas, um, and um, energy, and it would be great just to have them in from the beginning, in terms of a collaborative or at least a, you know a dialogue between right. those groups from the outset, so mm -hmm. that we kind of have this as a as a you know a building block from the beginning as we tackle this. Yes, yeah. good, okay. Well, it's been very productive and uh, thank you all for coming and uh, we will uh, continue this in a month's time and I hope to hear from you and uh, we'll see where we go with it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Thanks.